Hi, welcome. Um, I want to grab your attention in the cheapest possible way uh, to scare the shit out of you. Um, I have my hands on Pearl Dog. And it's really serious because Mark Allen, the current maintainer, and even Brian uh, have lesser objection. Um, so uh, what are my ideas? Um, of course, there should be a book like Good Pearl Practice or something like, because when you look at this code at Pearl Dog, really. But uh, I think that's not controversial. Some test suite would be nice. Yeah, but I think also less controversial, uh, better helps. A little, not only here and there, some more information, also more info per um, parameter, like Git and um, HG it has. When you um, uh, some parameter slash H, so you get help just for it. Also not controversial. What I want to talk about is uh, something about c consistency, indexing and search or um, um, to make it even shorter, find info um, fast. Um, on the consistency side, if you um, say Perldoc or OOTUT RevTUT, of course you see only the OOTUT and the RevTUT will ignore it. Um, and some, some sort of benevolent longest token matching. Uh, in short, it um, makes the command um, it passes uh, from left to right as long as it makes sense and ignores the rest. And um, this is like my first question. Do we want to let this go away and accept only input which makes sense from A to Z of the input? Uh, please all who, who want that, raise the hand, please, now. That was not... All right. Or, and who wants to keep the current uh, state of affair, please raise hands now. One. <laughs> That's significant, significantly less, I state. So you lost. All right. Um, now the thing is indexing. Um, of course, um, you have... Um, of the, the man pages have their index, the uh, fuck has some, but not for everything. If you look at Perl.org, you have um, the category references and they have you much more. And I want that uh, for Perl.org too. Yeah, because uh, one of the most used ca use cases of Perl.org is F split, uh, also F and then some function. And what I want, uh, if you say Perldoc minus F, so you get the index, but what functions are there? Yeah, also alphabetical or some uh, index by category. Um, I know there is some page, but it's long, and I want a real index uh, where just sig signatures, uh, maybe some hints on which pages you can read more to it. Um, who would like to see such index page? Uh, please raise hand now. That's a lot more. You're all on my side. Uh, I think I don't even have to ask the other question because you're more than 50% already. Cool. Yeah. Uh, you know, I still have to wrestle with the um, Perl portals uh, the way we do it. If you, I put it in the distro of Perldoc or in the core pages, but let me the, let that be my problem. Yeah. Uh, of course, something similar about variables. Uh, I want to make two. Yeah. Just an index, so you have an overview, what is what, you know, and you have an option, we and can uh, use the variable. Who's pro? No. Minus v is for both. No, it's not. No, no, there is no minus, no, there is no verbose option on Perlock. Believe me, I did my research. Uh, so, who, who would be against that? All right, it's, you're not the most people here. <laughs> yeah, of course, uh, O for ops is a bit ridiculous because um, the per site is here good. If you see the first page of the man page, it shows what you want to need. That's not such an issue. But um, on the module side, there I am um, against, um, or okay, last minute. Um, then I ask you, whoever used the minus small m option now and would be sad if I would rename it. Please. One. All right. 
seven pages. And who would not be sad if I rename the small minus m to small uh, big minus d? D, like, uh, 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 so, sorry, S for uh, source, because it shows the source, basically. Not sad. All right, yeah, also more. Yeah, um, because this is, was one of the few things where Mark Allen was a little bit uh, shaky. Uh, because uh, I want to um, make um, one of the other things, uh, introduce a little bit Levenstein, so it is tolerant the way uh, Perl 6 does, and some features more. But I'm out of time, and when I get another slot tomorrow or so, I will um, propose the rest of the feature. Thank you. So, hi everybody. Um, I'm going to split my talk into two parts, one about Perl 5 and the other one about Perl 6. So, um, first, um, over 9,000 requests. Uh, lots of credits to my brother who, um, provide, uh, who came up with the idea and that I'm going to talk about. So, we had a customer and he had a second-hand uh, bookshop, very simple business model, buy chip, still expensive. And he was looking for rare books and um, we should scrape the web for those rare books and um, well, give him a list of those rare books if they are in a certain price range so that he could buy them instantly. So um, to come up with um, code that does it is actually very simple. We have uh, those four rare books, um, some Perl books, um, for example. Uh, we use two modules, um, one user agent and a web scraper. We go through all those um, books and, well, we render those results in a web page and we're done. It's called totally easy. But there's a problem. You see, um, not that you're misunderstanding. I'm talking about the books. There are too many books, too many Perl books. If you take a look at the shelf, it's basically, you know, over 9,000. And, um, well, I actually thought not such a big idea. We're just going to increase the array. We're going to make, like, over 9,000 requests and to the web page and the server is going to happily send us all the results and we can render that. Well, um, actually, um, the customer had a um, uh, simple text file with more than 50,000 rare books in a um, certain price range that he wanted to um, scrape the web with. And, well, the server is going to say, go away. <laughs> yeah. So you're going to come up with um, something a little bit smarter. Yeah, for example, you change your IP, for example, after every single request. But how are you, gonna, how are you going to do this? Um, well, we're going to implement something like uh, IP roulette. So we just rotate it, and we get a new IP, and then we're done, and we can make a re request with another IP. So what could we probably use? Yeah, how about we use Tor? So I wrote a module that is um, going to connect um, the user agent to uh, let it gonna uh, talk with a proxy socket to the Tor network, and basically after every single request, you just well you rotate the roulette and you get a new IP, and the server's gonna be very happy if you have ten scrapers and everybody has his own IP, and um, after ten minutes you're done with your fifteen thousand books, and your customer is gonna be happy. The server not so much. Um, and so now for the um, second um, talk about um, Perl Sick. Lots of the credit should go to Jeff Goff. I'm sure he's somewhere around here. So I wanted to try out those <coughs> awesome grammars and wanted to write something by myself. And the first thing that I saw was um, probably SQLite parser because they've got those nice graphs and um, yeah, you could easily implement it by yourself. So what I did is I Look, took a look at the graphs and translated them, uh, translated like every single rule by myself, and it was tiring. Um, because yeah, SQLite grammar is actually very big, and um, sometimes I didn't quite understand the graphs that they showed on the web page, and so I took a look at some other grammars, for example, the Antler um, grammar of um, Java, and I ended up actually translating the Antler grammar and thought, well, that's actually stupid. Because I want to write lots of grammars, and um, well, how about we write something, then translate the grammar into a Perl 6 grammar so that we can write lots of parsers at once. So obviously the first thing that I did is I took a look at the modules, and, and there was already one module, uh, an Antler translator, uh, made by Jeff Goff, but um, it broke after the great list refactor, and um, so I tried to fix it. And well, by writing one parser, you can actually write lots of parsers if you translate it. So, 
yeah, this is basically the, mod uh, the module that I'm talking about. And if you take a look at the grammar, it's uh, very simple. It actually, uh, most, I think most of your people already wrote a grammar or just had a look at the um, Perl 6 talk just before. It looks kind of the um, Perl 6 grammar, just a little different. So all you're going to have to do is you parse the grammar, and you get the AST, and you translate it um, into Perl 6. And basically, what I've done so far is I got a translation of C uh, CSV, of JSON, of SQLite parser, of the Clojure parser. And I'm not sure if there are other parsers working as well, um, but it's sometimes tricky. And right now, I'm debugging all the stuff so that I get a working um, grammar. And it is actually, I think, kind of smart sometimes. For example, if you see the fields, um, it's going to translate. It's even going to use the um, percent percent to um, yeah, build the grammar. That's it. Take a look at the module and have fun with it. Hi, I'm Kenichi Isugaki, a developer uh, from Tokyo, Japan. And I've been a maintainer of DVD SQLite about since, uh, since about 2009 and CPANS around 2011, which I ported from Catalyst to uh, Motorishas. And I also changed ports where you upload CPAN modules to RAM plug framework uh, two years ago and deployed it last year. So if you happen to have experienced some slowdown, it's not my prob that's probably my fault. And I took, uh, last year, I took, also, uh, took over JSON and JSON PP. And this spring, I started porting post um, to Modulicious. And I, I talk about, I, I talk a little about it. And so this is second, second refactoring for me. And, and is there anything new? And there should be nothing for most of you out of yet. Yes. I have changed internal request and response objects and templates, routers, but, uh, so, and, and so forth. But it should work the same for you. If not, it, it's a bug. Uh, for us developers, I changed file layout. Previously, previously, everything was laid flat, but I gave some structure. I hope, it look, uh, I hope you like it, too. And I added debugging, debugging information at the bottom to see everything is OK. And as for debugging, I also used develop KYT profs. Uh, this is written by yet another Japanese hacker who works for a company in Kyoto, hence KYT. This is quite handy, and I love it. And I didn't work, want to port some admin features like core dump, so I dropped them. I'm sorry. <laughs> and that's, uh, oh, that's almost what I did at Pearl Tuesday Summit, but oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have several months by the next Tuesday Summit, I believe, so I'd like to add, do some more. Like, I need to do more tests, obviously. And I need to convert XHM to HTML5 because Modulicious doesn't support it by default. And this change may break your pause at, uh, some script if you if your script scrapes pause, so be warned. And pause tends to list everything related to you, but it's, if you have a lot of modules, it's kind of frustrating, so I, I'd like to add something to mitigate it. And probably you have heard that now you can upload Perl 6 modules to the pause, but pause currently doesn't have a feature to manage them, so there are a lot of, uh, several issues to solve but I'd, I'd like to fix something, and maybe more. Uh, if you have anything, let me know. And if you want to help me, uh, git call my folk and plug up up underscore 2000, uh, 2017.psg and test a live under leave post underscore 2000 t, uh, 2017 underscore uh, t. 
And I've, re I've written two reports at blogs.org. So thank you, and looking forward to your feedback. And many thanks to the past hackathon and summit organizer, uh, organizer and sponsors. Thank you. Hi, I'm Julian. Um, I'm going to talk about debugging LWP. So we all know LWP user agent. Um, it's contained in most of those things, like www mechanize, test www mechanize, soap light, soap compile, wstl, rest client, web scraper. We just heard about that, and a bunch of others. It is probably not contained in www mechanize, Chrome, or Firefox. We're going to hear about that on Friday. Um, it's often used under the hood. Um, but debugging it is really hard. So if you run into a problem, you usually end up here. And you're like, how does this work? Like, I'm Googling this every time. This is so annoying. And then you look at the results, and the posts are like 15 years old. And yeah, it's really <coughs> weird. So there's LWD, uh, LWP debug, which is deprecated. And it describes some stuff about debugging, but it um, doesn't really help. Um, then there are a bunch of really old blog posts. Um, yeah, but it's kind of frustrating. So um, yeah, I don't know. How do you get to the headers, for example? So you could do something like this, where you go like, OK, I have a result that comes out of the get. And then I do like result, request, a string. Um, yeah, that's pretty tedious. You can try to automate that. You can add those handlers. But then you need to remember how that works. It's like super weird, add handler. And then you have this, shit, uh, this sub, and you like take the thing and dump it out, and it's kind of weird. Um, but um, that's actually kind of explained in LWP debug. Um, and what you get then looks kind of like this. There's like your headers and stuff, and then you have this website. Um, but it's uh, it really sucks if you need to do that a lot. So um, so how do you do that if, for example, you want to do it in a catalyst model? Like you have like an API client in your Catalyst model, and it is super annoying to do that. So I went and built something, um, which kind of is like this. There's this package foo, and it uses class method modifiers, and it just wraps the constructor, and adds those things. It's like, it's very obvious. So then I went on IRC on hash LWP, and I asked basically, hey. Um, has anyone come up with this? I, I got this stuff. And well, there was Olaf Alders who said, yeah, there is LWP console logger. Um, and actually, LWP console logger easy is like you just create it, and then it works. Um, you just basically create one of those things, and you, um, you give it a mechanize or an LWP object, and well, then it dumps out a bunch of headers for you. And it looks kind of like this in your command line, which is quite useful. It has all of those nice tables and stuff, and um, or like this. Everything is very nicely organized. It's super useful. Um, and um, some stuff it does is like indents XML. It indents JSON. It converts XML to Perl data structures with XML simple. Well, but it's useful for debugging. And it does a ton of other things. It's super nice. Um, but it's still hard to use. You, you still have to have the UA object. So you have to pass it in. So let's combine things. Um, so what I did is uh, I wrote LWP console logger everywhere and sent him a patch. And you just use it. And that's it. So it worked with the LWP user agent and all its subclasses. It doesn't matter where they are. Like They can be super deep down in your app somewhere in some model, whatever. Uh, you just put it wherever you want. It gets loaded at compile time. And it will just work. So um, you do this. And you can even customize them. You can get the loggers out and like do stuff to them. And it's pretty cool for SOAP or for REST clients, especially when they're like super far down. And now I'm going to try to do a live demo. This is probably going to fail. Thank you. We don't have a lot of time. So I so, um, need to kind of watch somewhere. We have this um, client, which I'm going to start. And we have a server. Um, the server is like a server. And the client is another server that does a request. Shit, I can't see the screen. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm going to do a request, and um, well, stuff comes out. Thank you. So um, that was that was the wrong one, I think. That was stupid. <laughs> I need I need to edit this one, and it's not going to work because I don't have enough time. 
And then there's this nice delay on the screen. Ah! And somehow there's like stuff missing. This is very weird. The resolution on the screen is too small. I can't see the first two letters. Crap. Okay, and bam, and it just comes out. Thank you. So yeah, that thing is on CPAN. Just like use it. Thank you. So for the past 18 months, I have been working on a problem, which is getting all of CPAN, or, or helping to get all of CPAN ready to deal with the fact that uh, DOT was about to be removed from at Inc. Uh, if you guys want to find out more about that, uh, you can uh, read many of the blogs that are already online, or come to Sawyer's talk after lunch on Friday. Um, so when dot is removed from ink, the biggest problem is actually the tool chain. Uh, so your makefile PLs and your um, um, in, um, uh, build PL files. Um, uh, one of the bigger problems is module install because it does something like this. It says use ink module install uh, in that for the most part is depending on the ink directory uh, shipped with the uh, module uh, being present. Uh, and if it's not and you don't have module install in your system, the whole thing blows up in your face. So I brought this to, uh, to um, Toolchain and they rightfully told me, well, uh, go do some research, tell us how big of a problem this is. Uh, so easy solution, right? Go to grep.metacpan, do some searches and find out how bad it is, right? Except uh, not for the first time. This is what I got when I went to grep.metacpan. Um, so after much screaming at the screen and trying to get a hold of da David uh, Ledbetter uh, to try to bring the uh, thing back up, uh, I decided to implement my own solution, which is uh, and, and my idea was that I would simply extract, um, oh, my slides are out of order, uh, extract uh, all of um, the CPAN distros into a directory tree, uh, add it to get, commit it, and uh, then I could do searches easily. Um, and uh, that proved to be a little bit uh, bigger of a, um, a task to accomplish reliably uh, especially because uh, pause doesn't actually have a concept of distros, it only has a concept of modules. Um, uh, but uh, luckily I went to the pool, uh, Perl Tool Chain Summit and the Meta CPAN folks were uh, happy to adopt this as a project as part of their infrastructure. So uh, we got it up, we got it working. Uh, right now you can go to GitHub and uh, clone the uh, top URL you see there. Uh, and in only two gig of space and very few files, you can have all of CPAN checked out as a bare repo. Uh, now that, that doesn't mean you can wander around and look at the files, but with uh, creative use of git commands, uh, you can do interesting stuff. Uh, if you have a case sensitive file system and enough space and enough inodes, you can actually do uh, git clone of the <laughs> below uh, re, uh, URL and um, in about 16 gig of space, you can have all of uh, CPAN in one directory tree. Uh, so that allows you to then do interesting things. Like for instance, uh, the first thing I did with this uh, long ago was to walk each of the distros that had a makefile PL, run Perl makefile PL and see if it blew up uh, when dot was not in ink. So that it was very useful for that. Uh, another thing, uh, this was the original question that I uh, went to grep.cpan.me for, is to just find out how many distros are, are going to be broken as a result of this. And as it turns out, Adam Kennedy is responsible for 10% of CPAN being broken. 
Um, uh, you can also do things like this, get grep-l and actually see all of the files. Um, also at the Toolchain Summit, we implemented uh, uh, the uh, MetaCPAN front end. You can go to this uh, YouTube site or URL from uh, YAPCNA and um, find out about the front end that uh, is a replacement for grep.metacpan.me. Uh, this is what it looks like, uh, very similar to grep.metacpan. Um, here are the URLs and thank you. Um, so I'm going to be super nervous about this because this is a topic I'm not 100% sure this is right or wrong. So <clears throat> the title is Odagi, so it's a, it's a language. Dakeho, Goemia, she, Gugat, Wachima, Direkong, Daigi, Daigi, Taiwan Way, she, Jiquan, we, Manangu, Empenai, a Gian, Wachima, Direo, Daigi. So that was a little bit of a demonstration of the, how the language sounds like, and then but uh, you probably know a good amount of words. So in the Netherlands, they, that's originated from this language. Daoge. Lumpia, so you probably from, if you are living in Europe, you probably know this food. Babao, uh, so this is specifically mean meat bun. So if it's vegetarian, you shouldn't use this name. Um, interestingly, ketchup. So ketchup, tomato ketchup, these words actually come from so it doesn't really mean tomato ketchup in the original version. It actually means some fish, fish juice, like something that you eat with fish. Uh, so the original version was guijap, and then somehow this becomes tomato ketchup. Uh, so, and so this language uh, is although being so it, it actually has a ISO language code uh, like ZH Minan. So it also made its way to the. Um, to the platinum record on the uh, Voyager spaceship. There's like a, like a 10 second recording on it, but it's really lesser known. And it has like three writing systems developed mostly by non-Chinese people. Um, <laughs> so the, the, the first version is called Beiwei Ji. It's, like, it's really early, uh, or like almost developed from 200 years ago. And then there's another version, <coughs> it's called Kana. It's, uh, it's the one that's developed by Japanese people. And then there's like finally the, a recent version, like with a very, it's a slightly modification of uh, of Beiwei with less uh, weird characters. I'll describe later. So this is how Beiwei looks like. Uh, so it it, it looks kind of crazy with a lot, a lots of diacritic marks and then dashes and then like those small things around characters. It's created by three missionaries. They are they are English and American Amer American missionaries. They they. They sort of invent this system so they can translate Bible. And so this language has shitloads of consonants and, and, and vowels. <laughs> so that's consonant and vowels. There's also words that do, that do not have any uh, like usual consonants. So like there are three, three uh, words list down below. They are like, they, they pronounce like sing, meng, mm. So there's, there's, no, there's no like usual vowels in there. So, and then they combine to something like 700 syllables. Um, so that's like different kind of pronunciation this language contains. And, but there's more. There are tones. There are eight tones. So, which are, like, which is why you see those interesting diacritic marks. So, uh, I'm going to try this. So, so the, the so they, they pronounce like ah uh, ah. Uh, Ah, uh, up, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, up. Uh. So they are, they are actually, they actually have different meanings. Uh, <laughs> so this, like, this is generally how Chinese language works. Different tones have different meanings. But so, so eight tones into seven hundred syllables. That's the amount of sound this language could use to mean something. Uh, so, and in the writing system uh, that was developed two hundred years ago some interesting notation was used. And like they finally made their way into Unicode at 3.0 or something. Uh, so one of them is this superscript Latin small letter N. So that is used at the end of a word to mean there's a nasal sound attached to whatever syllables, syllables the, 
in the beginning. So like that's the, the, those three things sounds like jiu uh, or like with, without the end it sounds like chu. So and then there's another one that's like a, that's a small dot to the top right of any letters that that o, that only goes with o because there's like two o vowels like there's o there's a in in this language. So that that's used to distinguish this. Okay, so why am I doing this? I so this is the language of, of my mother's family, but I am never like being very fluent with it. So uh, recently, there are a lot of online resources. Like finally, it's like somebody put together and then sort of digital digitize all these together, and then there are multiple resources. There's even a Wikipedia uh, language like pages. They are like there's something like three thousand pages only, but it's actually quite resourceful. So. I, t I intend to write a like a simple search engine and then to search through the dictionary. So the way I, sh I need to I need to index this is to first remove the tone marks and then all those weird decorations. Turn and turns out that's only like a one liner in Perl. So you call this you call this NFD and then you call some split on 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 basically non letters and that basically work from there. So since this is basically a Perl talk. This this regular expression gives you everything uh, match one syllable, <laughs> and <laughs> so it doesn't really look like a singularity point just yet. But uh, it's pretty it's pretty large already. Uh, so finally, Doxia uh, Lai <laughs> Okay, so at last year's the Pearl Conference, I gave a talk about emulating APIs, which is my approach to developing against them, and. I concluded in saying, write an emulator, but I'm too lazy to write an emulator. So what I did, which is what I promised to do, is to write something to emulate APIs. And when I say any API, I mean any API that has a, an open API, open, open API specification, tongue twister. They define JSON, schema resp uh, JSON responses in the schema, so we can use those to generate mock JSON. And if you, your API doesn't have one of these specifications, you can visit this GitHub repo, which is user submitted specifications. And what I did is I wrote this module called JSON Schema to JSON, which is very badly named, but it takes JSON Schema and makes JSON, so it's self documenting in a way, maybe. And you can send it a JSON Schema and it outputs JSON. As you can see, the strings are nonsense, but for my use, that's fine. And you run it again, you get different data. Run it again, you get different data. And what I've done is I've combined it with Modulicious plugin OpenAPI to make a tiny little Modulicious light app which overrides the renderer and says, oh look, this isn't implemented. I'm going to look through the JSON schema spec and feed it into my module and return that as a response. So if I take the Instagram API spec, run it against that little emulator, I get all that from about 30 lines of code, which is very, 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 very useful to me because I do, I work a lot with REST APIs and I absolutely hate them. It has some caveats, so I'm not going to go into them, but you, if you're interested, you can look at the caveats. And that's that one. Okay, where are we? Okay, so this is my second lightning advert. I'm doing well here. I was at the Pearl Tool Chains Summit earlier on this year and uh, Sawyer had created this little Instagram account because I was there to shoot photos and he, he kind of handed the keys to this account to me and I've been uploading photos of the various Pearl events I've been to and obviously I can't get to them all unfortunately but I have noticed that there are a few people with cameras because photographers tend to notice people with cameras so if you are interested in submitting, contributing to this Instagram account then I wrote a little blog post on blogs.pearl.org about how you can do that. And I think it's very, very useful because lots of people start following and liking, and they're not involved with Pearl, so they're seeing, oh look, there's Pearl events happening, which is, I think, great. So please do contribute if you're interested. Okay, and now we are on to the Swiss Pearl workshop. Okay, so we have some nice big screens, so this is just an excuse to show some pretty pictures, really. So yeah, I bring some news from Switzerland of the Swiss Pearl Workshop this year. And there's actually been a Swiss Pearl Workshop for five years, I think. Yeah, five years. And we're not in the obvious places, like um, Geneva or Zurich. It's been in, OK, so maybe Bern is an obvious place with it being the capital. But it's also been in Alton. And if you're wondering why there's a picture of a train there, it's because there's a big interchange of trains in Alton. So you, if you search Flickr for 
Creative Commons photos are UK's trains. So, and it was in Innsbruck, which is uh, a bit surprising given that Innsbruck is not in Switzerland. But that was <laughs> that was a joint effort with the the Austrian Poet Workshop. So, this year it's in a villa, which is in the Vaudois Alps, just south of Lake Geneva, and it's the home of the company I work for, which is maybe the highest altitude pearl workshop in the world, I don't know, making that claim, but maybe somebody can uh, tell me otherwise. And what do we have? Well, we have views of a famous mountain, but not that one, it's uh, this one, Don de Midi. And we're in August, so there won't be any snow, but given the recent weather, condi weather conditions, there might actually be snow when you come, so. <laughs> and yeah, we have cheese and we, you know, we have chocolate. That's at the local supermarket, so. <laughs> And we have wine, and we have whiskey, so you can ask Wendy all about that, because she knows about the Swiss whiskey. Uh, Swiss whiskey. And we have beer, and uh, rosti, and pearl. We have lots of pearl. We have, I think, more than 50% pearl six talks have been submitted to the pearl workshop. Lots of talks. Workshops, maybe. We have Damien. So please do come to Villa um, to enjoy the Swiss Pearl Workshop and, and lots, lots more. And those are our sponsors. You can go to the pearl-workshop.ch and you can view the site there. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Well, yeah, OK. So to yeah, mix my Simpsons metaphors. Hi, I'm Dr. Nick. You may remember me from, well, whatever. Anyway, uh, these days I work for Geithaus Preisvergleich. And yes, we're hiring. Although it's a JavaScript, more JavaScript front-end developer job, so that may not suit some folks here. We're mostly a majority owned by Heiser Media Group, and I know they're hiring a DevOps person in Hanover, so that might suit people more around here. And I should disclaimer, the t-shirt's opinions are its own and nothing to do with my employer. <laughs> anyway, yeah, we're a price comparison site. You may know us also as cenovasca.pl or skinflint.co.uk, or many other names. Uh, the back end of a lot of our stuff is a whole bunch of Perl. We're using Postgres and running on Debian. Uh, we have um, about 1.6 million products. For all these products, we have a bunch of metadata, categorized products. We have name, we have a description, we have some keywords for them, and we have links, among other things. And most of this stuff is in three languages because, as I showed, we're trading in three countries, or countries with three languages. Um, and to get them from our database to you, well, they start off in a Postgres database. Um, and then a, back, uh, a background job uh, shoves all this stuff into Redis, and then the main web application server pulls the database out of Redis, and then it goes off to all of you. That's cool, we've decoupled it from the database, and Redis is excellent at spreading the load. Right, what's this talk about? So Redis is the internal store. What we used to be doing was we would store a blob of JSON for every product. Um, with our 1.6 million products and a bunch of stuff there, oh, I can't remember, I think about 1K each on average. Anyway, it got us to about two gigabytes of Redis store. We're using CPAN uh, JSON XS for that. It's a lovely module, thank you, Ryanie. And there's no reason not to use it. Uh, we're still gonna keep using it for all our external JSON APIs and everything that has to stay JSON. But this particular thing is an internal store. The thing that writes it and the thing that reads it are both totally under our control. What do we do? We switched it to serial. Serial is a binary serialization format written by Booking, uh, written by many folks at Booking and other things, um, and it's smaller and faster because it does a lot of clever design things. And the code that we used to switch it was pretty much this. Um, um, if what's coming out of Redis looks like Serial, well, okay, let's try decoding it as Serial or uh, throw out an error. Log an error, sorry. Otherwise, well, let's do the old code and pull it out and make it look like JSON. And um, then, yeah, we go on to the legacy code, which is completely unchanged and keeps making money. Legacy code being the ugly stuff that makes your money. What did this do? Well, it saved us about three quarters of a gigabyte. That was the level of complexity, which is nice in production systems, I've got to say. But we've got to, we're trying to get to the point of having per developer virtual machines which means each of those sometimes is going to have a private copy of this, dev memes, many virtual machines, we save massive amounts. So try it. The end. Thank you. So my day job, I work at cPanel. I, I write Perl. Yay, cPanel. Yes. <laughs> Who sponsored this conference hugely? Thank you. Um, on my, in my copious free time, 
Don't tell Nick I have some. Um, <laughs> thanks. I write for opensource.com occasionally, and I write about a lot of stuff. For a couple of years, I had a column where I would introduce folks to uh, open source projects you might not have heard of. Uh, last year for Halloween, I took a tour through Acme colon colon in CPAN and picked off four modules that I thought were entertaining or fun, including Damien's favorite, uh, Look of Disapproval. That was fun. And, and I featured them kind of as a Halloween feature in the column, and it went really well. Um, I've kind of stepped away from the column, and I'm working more on more programming-centric stuff and writing a lot about Perl, since, well, I write a lot of Perl. Um, but you might have questions about writing for opensource.com. It's like, what are you looking for? Well, your open source story. How did you get started in open source? Now, I realize for people like David Adler, that was a long time ago. Um, memory fades. Hey. <laughs> but if you, if you want to write about your open source story, how you got started in open source software, this is a good way to start. Um, what projects are you using in interesting ways? What are you DIYing with open source hardware or software? Tutorials. Uh, tutorials on using great new packages. Those are, those are kind of evergreen features that, that tend to get a lot of traffic. Interesting programming tips and tricks, name your language. Uh, geek culture. Um, maker movement, we do a lot of stuff about makers and people who are, are making things. Open source alternatives to commercial code. These are popular articles, these get a lot of, of sound. Well, but there are rewards to doing this. I don't get paid per se, to do this. I get paid to work at cPanel. Um, I do get a lot of traffic elsewhere because they provide lots of links back to me. Um, cool swag that you don't get any other way. Um, every so often we hit a milestone in how much traffic the site is getting a month, and when we do, they send us cool gadgets. And that's kind of nice. Fellowship with a bunch of really neat people. Um, and not just Americans, but from all over the world, uh, including one of our community moderators who lives right here in Amsterdam. Uh, expenses paid travel in the fall to All Things Open for the community moderators and columnists. I get to go to that. This will be my third year, and I'm speaking at the conference this year. Really, really nice conference. One of my favorites. But you have objections. I'm not a good writer. Big deal. We've got professional editors who will help you get better. I'm a better writer now than I was two years ago when I started. Quite a bit better. I'm not based in the US. Like I said a minute ago, big deal, we don't care. Um, community moderators come from all over the world and they don't care about paying how much it costs for all that travel. That's just part of the deal that comes with it. Uh, it's supported by Red Hat and I'm a Debian fan, big deal. <laughs> they, they really don't exercise a lot of editorial control. Now they don't want you bagging on Red Hat. But other than that, Pretty much, what you want to write about is up to you. And the editorial team will help you if you're close to the edges of that territory. And that's just fine. Um, I write about stuff, and when I, when I do a tutorial article or I do a, a how-to that I'm working on, the servers I test on are Debian. Nobody cares. You know, it's all app-centric, and, and I never get ging dinged for that. So. Um, Excited about writing for us yet? Anybody? Well, you can find out more. We've got a, a link on opensource.com about write for us, how to get in touch with the editorial team. If you've got an idea for an article, uh, you can present it there, and the team will tell you, hey, that'd make a great article. Why don't you write for us? We'd love to have you writing for us. Tell them I sent you. Or you can just ask me if you have more questions. Thank you very much. OK. So I told you about the past, now I'm going to tell you about the future. And these are the new features that might show up in Perl 528. Of course, we can't make any promises because things change. Uh, uh, maybe Sawyer gets deposed and the promises he made to me at the Swiss Perl workshop don't work out anymore. But here's some stuff. Uh, Auto-referencing. This is a thing that beginners often make a mistake with. They want to call a function like foo, and they give it a hash or an array, but they forget to reference it. And so now in your signature for foo, uh, if you say that you need a reference, it's just going to figure that stuff out for you. Not a big deal. Um, wow, some, oh, because I did one of these stupid things with, let me go back. 
show up, show up. Three state tap, not okay, not okay, okay. Eh, it didn't work out, but eh, I, I don't feel like failing today. I, I seriously want this. Um, I've got like a half promise. I think if someone wants to step up and sponsor the Pearl Foundation for half a million, he'll agree to it. Okay, a better safe. How many people have used safe? You can turn off various features in Pearl. Well, it's gonna get a lot more interesting because it's going to figure out what levels you should be allowed to use based on your prior experience in Pearl. There will be a variable called Pearl level. Um, you don't get to set this. It will be set for you by, we don't know what yet. Um, we're thinking big. We don't have to have all the answers at the start, but that's how it's gonna work out. Better get stuff. Right now, the compiler can realize that there are git conflict markers. So if we can do that, we can do something really cool. If it sees those, it will run both versions. <laughs> and, and not only that, it's going to choose the one that gives you the correct results. <laughs> now, we haven't figured out what happens if there's like a, a bunch of different merges going on in there at the same time, but you know, we have time to figure that out. Distributed map and grep. This is the wave of the future. We're going to distribute things. There will be a variable, Perl worker pool, and you can put an IP address in there. Now, it doesn't matter if you can control it or not. <laughs> it will just take over that part of the network and use whatever it finds there. So, and this will automatically happen when you say use parallel and then the maps and all the greps and all that sort of stuff automatically get these features. Oh, this one's going to be fun. Because you know, everything is about AI. We're going to start saying AI everywhere. We're going to get tons of grant money, tons of DARPA money, and all this sort of stuff. So you know we have the yada yada, but this is going to be the alada. So yada yada is just like, there's some stuff there, but now we're going to put a bunch of stuff there. It's an experimental feature, of course. But we're going to put the three dots in there. And now that we've loaded this, it's going to, instead of just failing, saying, oh, you didn't implement this, it's going to implement what it thinks you meant to do based on all the context around your program and then you're, it's going to go on. And if we get this really good based on all the programs you've written before, um, you don't have to program anymore. Um, remember my, my lesson, don't tell people how you did it and don't tell you what, uh, what's going on. The close enough operators, oh, this one I, I really love. This is the one I want the most. Is seven equal enough to eight? <laughs> There'll be some ways that we can t tweak this based on your preferences. Is it not? equal enough to eight? Is it a lot greater than six? <laughs> is it a lot greater than three? Okay, uh, we'll say it's a lot greater than three. Is it a lot, lot greater than three? A, a bunch greater. And then we have the various versions, same thing with less than uh, and so on. Some new array operators. You know about unshift, that's not new. Might be new to some people, but it's not new. <laughs> Um, um, push isn't uh, new either, but shove will be. <laughs> push is just you get on the end of the array. Shove, you get pushed further into the array. <laughs> There's going to be cut in. So I'm going to go farther into the array and figure out where I think I should be, and I'll put myself there. And then, of course, this one's really nice, but it doesn't look like it, uh, it actually does anything. There's going to be VIP is it looks like the seven never got onto the line, but you know what the VIPs are. They never stand in the line. They go to the front and they're immediately processed and then they're never there. We're gonna have some better diagnostics. The W plus, um, the warnings are turned off, but no, this one's really important. So I'm gonna show it to you anyway. P is, is gonna be this thing where you, uh, because you're using Perl, you have to do it in a certain number of ways and you haven't met that quota yet. So it is going to convert the code for you into some other way to do it. And then you'll have to learn that and that'll probably go into your Perl worker score for the, the safe stuff. I, just nope, not gonna do it. And then finally, this one um, is gonna be zero. That's not capital O, it's just, this program appears to be a waste of time. Just, I'm just not going to run it. OK, thank you. So, madness for your methods, attempt two. So, um, a long time ago, um, I accidentally got volunteered to help maintain a thing called Catalyst. Um, blame Sebastian Riedel. Um, and so, that used 
um, attribute syntax to be able to add annotations to subroutines um, to provide routing information, which is all very well in terms of the syntax it provides users, um, but it uses attributes.pm under the hood, and oh, hell, seriously, I, I have written more than one implementation of the Catalyst attribute system. I think Florian Ragvets was unlucky enough to write the third, but it, it, it's not saying. Um, so what I really wanted was custom keywords, so I could do, I could do something like more elegant than that. Um, but the thing is, there was no way we were going to get that as a feature in course, so I needed to prove it on CPAN. Um, Three Pumpkins told me it was impossible. Um, about a year later, I managed to demonstrate that actually it was only really, really, really horrible. Um, that proof would be known as Devil Declare. Um, so later on, um, we managed to trick Zephram into taking comment of it. Um, and then there was some screaming. And then he decided that rather than ever have to try and help maintain that, he'd add a pluggable keyword API to core and obsolete it instead. <laughs> Which was exactly what I always wanted to happen because I knew I wasn't competent to write devil declare. And to be entirely honest, if you look at the source code, it really shows. Um, so a devil declare can now mostly be forgotten, um, except as a way to scare small children and junior developers. Um, but I like fat packing. I like being able to bundle dependencies so that I can do single file deployment. So I tried to make a pure Perl version. And it went horribly wrong in all sorts of amazing ways, like trying to pass keywords in comments. Um, I'm not sure that code ever made it to CPAN. I'd really like to forget I wrote it. Um, couldn't figure out a more sensible way of doing it. Forgot about it for years. Um, and then, yep, CNA, and also today, Damien Conway happened. Um, and so I went, oh, hang on, this was the one bit I had no idea how to do. And um, I put a year of my life into Devil Declare. This resulted in a cascade of things that resulted in Damien putting six months of his life into PPR. And now I have the missing part. Excellent, right. So how do I test a keyword approach? Obviously, I implement a method keyword that takes method foo and converts it to my dollar self equals shift and takes method with an argument and converts it through to an at underscore unpack, right? So with the joys of, all right, how does the German keyboard actually, yeah, accept the key presses. Oh God, this thing's slower than test suites using moose. Um, so, um, so you build up a grammar that has, you know, method, white space, identifier, white space, block, white space, that's great, PPR grammar, pull it in, break out the source filter module. Um, obviously, you don't, now source filters are only terrible because they're having to par parse Perl themselves. I just outsource that to Damien, so it's relatively safe. So I slurp in the entire module, loop around looking for um, instances of the method keyword, pull it out, um, and then I can go and match the various chunks of it, um, rearrange it to add the various bits of verbiage I need and the underscore unpacking, and then use, f use L value substr to chuck the new code back into place, fiddle pause for the regex match back to the right place and continue. Okay, cool, but that only handles them at the top level if your top level statement is method. What about a method inside, say, a package block? Okay, so what are we gonna do? Well, what we do is, we take a local of the pos, and then when we get to the end, that question mark colon can push the start point and the length of the found block onto a global array. At which point you have the local app found and can basically chuck that in. And that bit's nice enough, um, but that's still a dependency. So what's better than MST where plus Damien where? Let's add Ingi where. <laughs> Break, so we factor out the mangle thing and we break out module compile, put the mangling in, and then you can have a compilation example that uses method signatures pp compile and spits out a .pmc with a checksum at the top, and then the use method signatures pp has gone away and your method keyword has been converted to a sub. Now, okay, syntax errors in this will be epic failure because if it doesn't manage to parse it, it's just not going to be happy. I chatted to Damien afterwards. He's improved PPR to give better errors. I've not improved this module to actually use the better errors. I suck. So use function parameters during development and switch to method signatures PP for deployment. And it is on CPAN already. It's probably a terrible idea, but have fun. <laughs>